Eric King coming to you once again from Nugget of Truth. We're going to be looking at a very important topic in this lecture, and um, it has to do with a, a, an, an early schism, an early um, a sect that broke off of true Christianity right there along the coast of Asia Minor, Minor that faced the Aegean West, that was the Aegean, Aegean Sea there, and along that coast and into uh, Asia Minor, uh, which is now predominantly, you know, when you get into Turkey and Russia and those areas. But predominantly back in the time of the Apostle John, that's where a lot of the younger churches were. And we know in our apocalyptic studies that, that God chose Apostle John to take seven of those churches in Asia Minor and use them as examples of the progression of how the church would unfold um, all the way up to the seventh time period period that we're in now, that of Laodicea, it would show the progressive unfoldment of how the church would, would start out and how it would go throughout time. And you have to remember that everything in Revelation, all the septenary mysteries, including the seven trumpets, the seven seals, the seven bowls of God's wrath, including those seven churches themselves, are progressive stages of the church throughout time. And in, in one of those churches, in two of those churches, the first church, Ephesus, um, that uh, John uh, gets a revelation about through Jesus Christ, it, and then the Lord gives counsel to that Ephesus church, and he says that, that they had rejected a, church, a, a teaching, a false teaching that was being taught by um, the, the Lycanaetans. Now, the Lycanaetans, um, which is what we're going to be discussing in this, in this talk, were a group of Christians that were not teaching proper doctrine, and they were practicing things that were not Christian. And Jesus Christ said that he hated and he hates those of the Nicolaitans and those who practice uh, that kind of Christianity. And we're going to discuss what that is and show that it's even being practiced today in modern times. But his counsel to the church of Pergamos, of course Pergamos was the, was the central uh, was the central site of Asia Minor. It was the headquarters. It was the it was where the, the seed of the culture of Asia Minor was was personified. Pergamos was the was the um, was the focal point of Asia Minor, and and uh, it's also known as Pergamum. Uh, Perg Pergamos is is the feminine uh, rendition of the neuter Pergamum. Pergamum was a more popular term used for that region, and so we'll stick with the term Pergamum. But Pergamum was, again, a church that was highly influenced by paganism and a specific kind of paganism. We have to understand that um, uh, the, the Asia Minor churches, again, are examples of the, the crises that were going on in the churches of Asia Minor are, are, are issues that are, are carried on throughout church history and are still predominant in our modern churches today even here in the United States of America. So, what, it, what, who are the Nicolaitans? Who were they? Well, there are some scholars that believe that they were actually a group founded by Nicholas. Nicholas uh, was one of the first uh, deacons of the Antiochian church, actually mentioned in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Now, we don't know exactly if it was Nicholas, that Nicholas that went awry and began this sect or this movement or this group, but there seems to be some evidence that it very well could have been. And what, what was he teaching? What did he begin to teach? Well, the, the word Nicolaitans itself, uh, uh, Nico or Nico, uh, is the Greek word that means to conquer or to overthrow. And Laos, the last part of it, Nicolaitism, Nicolaitan, Nicolaitans, Laos uh, means to conquer, it means the, the people or the laity, the leo, the laity of the church. So Nicolaitanism was um, pro propping up clergy in the church, propping up what later became archbishops and even a pope, uh, making higher offices of clergy that would predominate uh, over the laity of the church. They would be the ones that ruled the church in a way that the Bible uh, does not instruct us to do the gut when we get into church government and how the church operates. So the Nicolaitans basically started a hierarchical priesthood in the church. We see that carried over today, predominantly in the Roman Catholic Church, which we're, which, which we're going to bring up in this study. Now, one of my er, early favorite saints is Arrhenius, and Arrhenius tells us in in his again one of his volumes of Against Heresy, 
uh, speaking of the Nicolaitans, which were even existing in his time, and he, he, he says that during his time, and even Clement of Alexandria documents the Nicolaitans, and says that they were, they were living in a, in a kind of a, 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 an early Gnostic, an early Gnostic belief system. Now, it probably incorporated Docetism, which was a precursor to Gnosticism. That we don't really know, but we do know that they were playing with, with a very liberal form of Gnosticism. That's what Nicolaitanism eventually eventuated into. But it started out with the idea of creating a hierarchy clergy that would dominate the, the, the members of the church and have final say over what goes on in the church and what should be taught, what shouldn't be taught, what should be practiced, what shouldn't be practiced in the church. Now, Arrhenius says, in Against Heresies, he says that the Nicolaitans lived lives of unrestra unrestrained indulgence. Now, what we're going to find is, is that basically they were also involved in, what, in what's called antinomianism. And antinomianism started early in the church. It was that once uh, certain people were taught that we're saved by grace through faith, there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. The extreme of, of that was, well, then there's no morality. We don't have to worry about morality. And so Nicolaitism today is, is our churches that practice this hierarchy of clergy, and they rule over the members, and then the members of the church go to church once a week, but in between time, they pretty much live like the rest of the world, and they call themselves Christians. That's basically what the fruit of Nicolaitanism is, and that's basically what we're seeing practiced even in Protestant churches today in the United States and throughout the world, which is very sad. Um, these were what we could say Christians only in name, but certainly not in practice. It was the idea of a higher clergy will pay them, will pay the salary of the clergy, will we'll help pay for the rent of the church building, will help do this, and we'll go once a week, and we'll, we'll have uh, cupcakes and ice cream on certain days, and then pretty much live like the rest of the world the rest of the time. So a lot of people do this. They go to church. Um, just to gain prestige or, or, or their higher echelons in certain corporations or co companies and they want to look good so they take their wife and their children to church but predominantly they, 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 they throw everything on the clergy and it's the responsibility of the clergy to live the, the Christian life and, and it's, the, uh, it's the idea that the clergy are the holy ones and they, they pray for us and they do all the work for us all we do is go there, listen and drop money in a bucket and so this is Nicolaitanism today now, Hippolytus, another early figure in church history, says that the founder of the Nicolaitans, he says, quote, unquote, they departed from the correct doctrine. And, and that the founder of the Nicolaitans, he says, was in the habit of inculcating indifferences of food and life. Now, Hippolytus brings up something very important. He says they had departed from correct doctrine. And you know that what we teach here at Nugget of Truth, we teach correct doctrine. It's very important. Paul said that actually true doctrine is important because it's actually true doctrine that unites the body of Christ. We're all on the same page and we're all on the page of Jesus Christ because we get our doctrine from his word. But, but here again we see that all errors start when people turn away from, from sound doctrine and they get caught up in incorrect or false doctrine. And as I stated earlier, Clement of Alexandria says that, that the Nicolaitans, he says, they abandon themselves to pleasures like goats. <laughs> so basically here again we have the idea that the laity of the church, the common folk of the church, were, were living pretty much predominantly like the rest of the world and they were only Christian in name. So, so the question becomes, uh, the problem is, is that are Christians that much different from the people of the world? Do we really have to be, as Christians, do we really have to be that bright, the bright light, the standout when we go into places? Do we really have to be that different from the world? Must, must a Christian be different from, sec, from the secular world? Must a Christian really be that different from the world? And that was the question that the Nicolaitans uh, answered, and their answer was, no, we don't have to be different from the world because why because we're saved by grace through faith and that and therefore there's no more morality and that was the extreme view of what became known as antinomianism which means uh, no 
no morality. Now, we read in the book of Jude, which is right before the book of Revelation, it's only one chapter long, long and we read in, in a, a group similar to this group of Nicolaitans, if it was not the Nicolaitans themselves that he's referring to. I tend to believe that it was, that Jude was referring to this group. And he says in verse 7, In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example for those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. And he also says that they used the grace of God to, to live in sin. Um, he says in verse 4, They are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. So he says they, they, uh, they change the grace of God as a license to sin. They think, well, God loves me. He died for me so I, in the person of Jesus Christ, so I can live pretty much like I want to. And that's the danger we see in secular Christianity today. Now, we're going to find that Nicolaitanism blossomed, the idea of setting up a higher clergy that would rule the church blossomed in what we would call modern-day ecclesiasticism today, uh, predominantly starting and grounding itself, Nicolaitanism did, in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, uh, the Nicolaitans were said to typify the prophet Balaam. And of course, we know in the Old Testament that Balaam was a prophet of Israel that basically got paid. To, uh, he, he, put, he put monetary gain and his own personal gain above, above what God wanted, and he he took his title name as a prophet and he used it abusively and he, he, he for, for personal gain, he, he coaxed Israel into sinning. He coaxed in, Israel in, into committing idolatry and fornication. And that's recorded in the Old Testament. So he took God's, Balaam took God's people and he corrupted their doctrine and got them involved in worldly things. This is what Nicolaitanism was doing in the Christian church during the time of John. It was taking... Christian in name only, but it was bringing the world into the church. We see that today with, with um, some of the music that comes into the modern day churches and the way that men and women dress and the things that they talk about and the things that are being preached from the pulpit uh, have to, are, are not from the Word of God, but their uh, uh, neo-psychology is being taught from the pulpit rather than the Word of God. Again, I'm connecting modern day uh, uh, influences of Nicolaitanism. Now, uh, as, a, as I stated earlier, we know historically that the Nicolaitans existed uh, uh, later on uh, in the Gnostic teachings. In the Gnostic teachings, uh, they mingled Gnostic teachings with Nicolaitanism, and we know that today modern Gnosticism is, is neo-psychology and New Ageism. And we see that today influencing the church um, the same way it was influencing the church, and it wasn't called by that back then, but it, we see that it, those types of teachings and ideas were influencing the early church during the time of the Apostle John in Pergamum. Um, the famous Pliny uh, said that Pergamum, he said, by far was the most famous city in Asia, as I mentioned earlier, was the headquarters of Asia Minor, Pergamum. And we find that in the book of Revelation, Pergamum is called, during the time of John, the headquarters of Satan. Now, it was called the headquarters of Satan because Attilus III, when Alexandria conquered that region, eventually that region was split up, and Attilus III was a, was a priest king in Pergamum, and he was a priest king of the ancient Chaldean religions and the Babylonian religions. So he was a high priest king of the Chaldean hierarchy. And Pergamum remained the, 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 uh, the central capital of Asia Minor under Attilus III. But after Attilus III's death, uh, a Pergamum was willed or handed over to Rome. And so by the time we get to the Apostle John... It went writing on the island of Patmos, the book of Revelation, and, and the Lord Jesus is warning against the heresies that were going on in, in Pergamum. It's called, at that time, it's called pretty much the headquarters of Satan. Why? Because Rome was there. And one of the religions that Rome brought to Pergamum and popularized in Pergamum during the Christian era was, of course, Zeus. And there was another religion 
popular pagan religion in the central capital of Asia Minor, Pergamum, that had to do with serpent worship. And there was even coins that they found that have this serpent on them. And this serpent was uh, uh, depicted with, with the ruler's hand on the head of the serpent and basically get, saying they're getting their power from, from Satan. And, and so there again, Rome, Rome used Pergamum as a headquarters there. And so when the Christians were meeting in Pergamum, Rome started getting into the church and influencing the church. And then because of its Chaldean uh, background in, in ancient Babylonian, Babylonian worship that was going on in Pergamum, we're going to see that some of the practices of the priests of the pagan religions of, of ancient Chaldea and Babylon that were predominant in Pergamum, those ideas came into the church through the influence of Nicolaitanism. They came into the church through Nicolaitanism. Now again, Pergamum did not have the eco economical greatness of all of the other little surrounding cities there in Asia Minor, but it was the center for cultural influence. So, so it had a very strong influence on, on the surrounding regions of Asia Minor. And one of the interesting things uh, that most people don't know is that, and I, we've mentioned this in some of our other historical studies of the early church, was that in Alexandria, Egypt, you know, uh, Alexander the Great um, conquered that portion of Egypt and, 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 and it became known as Alexandria. And in that library of Alexandria in Egypt, all of the, the books and parchments, parchments that, scrolls that were, that were uh, taken from areas that he conquered, um, amalgamated and were collected there in that, in that library of Alexandria. It had, a, it had an exquisite library of, of ancient literature in the Alexandrian library. And, and that library is, was, was only second to the Pergamum li library. The, the library in Pergamos had well over 200,000 plus parchments stored in, in the library of Pergamum. So there was a lot of intellectual uh, 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 wise men and women uh, in Pergamum. And that worldly knowledge, that worldly influence of that knowledge uh, also was influencing the Christian church of Pergamum. Uh, again, the Pergamum Library was pretty much only second to the library there in Alexandria, Egypt. And I have to say that, that the remnants of both the Pergamum and ancient Alexandrian library are predominantly today archived in the Vatican Library in Rome. That's a library I've seen pictures of, and I've seen um, pictures of what the inside of that library looks like, and it would be, it's kind of a dream of mine someday to go uh, to, to, it would be really cool to go into that uh, the Vatican Library there and see the records that they've got stored there at the Vatican Library. And of course, that that library at the Vatican is, is highly protected, and and only certain people can go in and out of that library, even unto this day. So again, we find that the amalgamation of Babylonian doctrine uh, regarding the mixing of different pagan ideas, specifically in regards to church government starting to influence the church of Pergamum. So another thing that we have to consider here is that, and I, we've discussed this in our Gnostic studies, that were, there were religions known as the mystery religions. Now Christianity and Judaism involves mysteries, but mysteries of a different type and mysteries in a, diff in, in, in a different category and we use the word mystery differently in the New Testament Bible, as Paul used the Greek word mysterion differently uh, in, as Christians, as we understand God's mysteries differently than what were known as the mystery religions. The mystery religions were religions that involved initiation rites. They involved um, an hierarchy of priests. Um, a lot of the practices of the ancient initiatic schools and mystery schools of uh, Pergamos and, uh, and Babylon and ancient Egypt, the Osirian cult of Egypt is really where a lot of it all began. Uh, and we could say even uh, before that um, in ancient Sumeria, uh, uh, where the Garden of Eden in that area used to be over there, what, um, uh, we know that there was influence of uh, early on of mystery religions and occult practices going on there. But the the, in Pergamum, during the time of the Apostle John, uh, the Nicolaitans, a group of Christians, again, being influenced by such things, even being influenced by the ancient mystery schools of Pergamum, uh, that involved a hierarchy, uh, hierarchy, uh, hierarchy priests 
and even priestesses called Vestal Virgins. And as a matter of fact, we see that when Constantine basically, uh, Constantine, when, when he, when during the Great Schism, and we have that in other studies, when Constantine basically uh, protected Christianity, and I want to say that I believe that Constantine, that God did allow Constantine to protect Christianity when there was a lot of things going on politically and geographically all throughout the world, and partic particularly hot in those regions at that time. I believe that God did choose Constantine to protect uh, early Christianity. Of course, Constantine uh, brought some of his own heretical teachings into Christianity, and I want you to key in on this. We in our records, and I've said here that, you know, we've been blessed here uh, at Nugget of Truth to have records of the early church, predominantly records from the ancient Antiochian school uh, uh, records, and we, we know that Constantine basically was influenced by the Nicolaitans. He was influenced by the Nicolaitans in the idea of, 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 of setting up a, a different kind of church government than the apostles uh, originally practiced in the church. And so Constantine basically influenced by the ancient mystery religions brought some of those, not some of those, quite frankly, he brought a lot of those um, teachings into the Christian church at Constantinople. And some of those doctrines that, that basically stem from the early heresy of Nicolaitanism are prayers for the dead, which started in the early Christian church around 300 AD, the worship of saints, and angels, which, which uh, took ground in 375 A.D. in the Christian church. Uh, the style, that the Roman Catholic style of a mass worship, what they call mass, which involves ritual and the Eucharist um, in 394 A.D. And then in 431 A.D., um, stamped, of course, at the Council of Chalcedon, which came later in 451. But as early as 431 A.D., we see them beginning to... Uh, prop, prop up Mary and create a, a Mary theology, uh, Mary doctrines around Mary, based also on the ancient mystery school teachings that were influencing, that influenced the early Pergamum church through, again, the Nicolaitans. All of this can go back to the Nicolaitans who, who started in Pergamos, or who started in Pergamos. Some would say uh, they started with Nick, Nicholas, the deacon Nicholas, who, who, who came out of Antioch. And, um, of course, the Antiochian school would have fully rejected that. Um, we have records that the early Antiochian school was quite pure. And if, 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 uh, if, he, if he got kicked out of Antioch, that's why Nicholas started his um, Nicolaitan uh, heresy in Pergam Pergamum, because he would have had to have been kicked out of Antioch. Be that as it may, the worship of Mary uh, predominantly stomped at the Council of Chalcedon, in the doct of of the the Antiochian Church making the dire mistake at that time, 400 plus years later, in 451 A.D., accepting the heretical uh, w the doctrine of Theotokos, which led into the heretical teachings of the worship of of Mary. And then, in uh, uh, as early as 500 A.D., we have the priests um, dressing in elegant robes um, and vestments, priest vestments. And, of course, this comes again from the mystery hierarchical priesthood that was practiced in the ancient Babylonian mystery schools. They, they uh, hear that these, these corrupt Christians were admiring some of the tactics these, these uh, pagan religions had uh, were, and were practicing, and they said, well, we're just going to incorporate that now into the church. Uh, it, by 526 A.D., a, a lot of Roman Catholic ritualism, a lot of what, what we see in, in, in ritualism, in the Eucharist, and all of these types of things, and ordination rites, and all of these types of things, bishops and archbishops, and all of these types of things, started really to take ground in 526 A.D. And then in 593 A.D., the doctrine of purgatory was introduced. And, of course, we know that the, the doctrine of purgatory uh, is... It, it, it comes from many different pagan religions. Uh, it's not taught in, in Sola Scriptura. Jesus Christ didn't teach it. The apostles didn't teach it. It comes 500 years later uh, into the church. It creeps in around 593, the doctrine of purgatory. And then in AD 600, uh, the language of Latin predominantly becomes what they call the magical language of the church, uh, stating that all masses and worships had to be held in in the magical language of, of Latin. 
And then by 600 AD, we have the rosary, praying with beads, prayer beads, which again comes from a lot of uh, pagan religions, um, uh, even going all the way back into India and uh, um, uh, Vaishnavism and Mayavadism and those influences coming into the church some 600 years after uh, the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, all of these got wedged. Got, all of these got started in the church through the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitan heresy was where a lot of these church, where, where all of this heresy began. And by the time you know earlier, before, like when we get around about 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea, we have about. There was about 1,500 delegates uh, that came that had all been influenced by Nicolaitan Christianity, about 1,500 delegates. And these delegates outnumbered the bishops five to one at the Council of Nicaea. And it's not that, that, that the deity of Christ, uh, which, which they confirmed at Nicaea, the deity of Christ was correct. They, they confirmed the correct understanding at, at Nicaea, uh, in 325, the doctrine of Christ's deity. That was correctly confirmed there. But my point in this is that, that at that time, that was the big first biggest show of Nicolaitans congregating together and predominantly uh, gaining the ground, the, uh, the early rising and power of what became known as the Roman Catholic Schism or the Roman Catholic Church to this day. And a number of once pagan basilicas Constantine, through his conversion to Christianity, his conversion, so to speak. Now, I can't judge whether Constantine was truly converted or not. I will say that the practices that he set up in the church, his motive and intention might have been a, um, that he thought he was doing the right thing, but actually it wasn't the right thing to do. So that th those things go to different studies we've done on the early history of the church, and you can, you can watch some of our early studies on the history of the Christian church to get to get that information. But but basically, he took a lot of these ancient mystery school temples and basilicas that were already existing in Asia Minor and in Rome, and he, he gave them over to the Christians. And so the Christians, like, again, we get into the fact that um, in 500 AD, they were already had set up a, a fake clergy that was based on the Nicolaitan teachings and the Nicolaitan heresies. And so you already have a hierarchy of priests starting in the church. Now they're giving these big big basilicas and, and golden lampstands that were once pagan are now uh, incorporated in these Christian rooms of worship. And you have, you have uh, uh, elaborate buildings and elaborate de decorations being accepted, and of course, this gave power. You know, uh, when 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 a common person walked in a in a in a basilica, and and saw saw the pomp, and and, and uh, the pomp and glory of the art and and uh, of whatnot that was in these, they were overwhelmed. Certainly, the presence of God must be here, right? And and of course, Roman Catholic churches today. And even some of the Greek Orthodox, a lot of the Greek Orthodox churches fall in, fell into this trap. And what happened was, is that, you know, when you walk into these places, they're kind of self-hypnotic. Um, the artwork is exquisite. It's beautiful. And I'm an artist, so I'm not against artwork. But there's a danger in bringing artwork into a place of worship. Because it creates an atmosphere of idolatry. And it, and it, creates, it creates an atmosphere where, where people who are weak in those areas of their faith can fall into those traps of idolatry. And... And it gives a false, a false sense of power. You know, God is powerful. He doesn't need all that pomp and glory. And look around nature. Look at the awe of nature. And a lot of us have become desensitized simply by the, the, beauty, the beauty of nature is awe-inspiring enough, right? I mean, when Jesus Christ was teaching uh, during, uh, around the Sea of Galilee, sitting under a tree, he was pointing to the sparrows, and he was pointing to the birds, and the skies, and the clouds, and the stars. And he was pointing to nature to show the glory of God. He didn't need all the false pomp and glory uh, that man produces. Again, I'm not against Christian artwork. I'm not against the beauty and awe of, of what artists can produce. But there's a danger in bringing that into a place of worship. And so we find here again the influence of Nicolaitanism taking ground and taking over the church. 
That's on top of the false doctrines they were already teaching. They were already starting to teach false doctrines. They were already starting to teach this false idea of pomp and hierarchy order in the church. And it gives the impression that when you go to a church, it gave the impression to the common folk that when they went to church, they were hearing this 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 mass in Latin. And this a lot of them didn't understand Latin. They called it a magical language. So you, you see this... this priests up there dressed in gold and golden robes and you see golden and marble and pearl and statues and he's looking at you speaking in this mumbo jumbo with his hands and doing these magical things over your body and doing this and you come up to him whoa and then when he sends you outside the church once you get outside the church they go oh then they would live like the rest of the world then they make up for it again next sunday and go drop some money in a bucket and get blessed by a priest so this is this is I'm pointing this out to show you that this is the Nicolaitan heresy, and the Nicolaitan's heresy is predominantly still practiced today in many churches. And I would challenge you that if you're in a church that's been influenced by the by the the Nicolaitans, that you take in what I said and you do your own research regarding this issue, so that you can come to appropriate conclusion. And you have to go to the Word of God and pray for yourself and go to God's Word, and God will lead, guide, direct, protect you into the truth without all of this, the fringes and uh, glamour and cosmetics of today's church. you got to get through that and get back to the Word of God. Now, the next thing that this Nicolaitan, the Nicolaitan doctrine led to was the dangerous eschatological view of postmillennialism. And I just want to end by pointing this out to all you that are stuck in the Roman Catholic or have have found yourself seduced by the Roman Catholic doctrine of replacement theology. Replacement theology by under uh, Boniface the Third and and the, and other and other popes. Uh, they believed that that Jesus would not come back and have to come back and set up that premillennial kingdom of Christ. They looked at their temples and the beauty of their temples and the backing of the political powers of that time, and they started to teach that, oh, the millennium will be set up by the church. The millennium will be set up by the church. And of course, towards the end of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, shortly when we get into about 375 AD, when they start to really get this idea, we have the dark ages of the church. That's where the Roman Catholics took swords and knives and weapons and said, we're going to set up the millennium. It'll be a theocracy on earth with the Pope as the vicar of Christ. And you have a thousand year dark period. That was their time to set up a post-millennial reign. The church to set up a post-millennial reign. And what did they do? Created the dark ages. And God protected the, two, the true premillennial view. And we've documented this. Uh, we, I've given you, uh, I've given over 10, 15 different uh, servants of the Lord throughout those dark periods that were protecting the premillennial view of Christ. And by the time we get up to the Reformation in the 1500s with Martin Luther, and we come out of that with Tyndale, Wycliffe, Huss, and Jerome, and finally Luther, and we come out and we come out of that, then the true doctrines start to come back to the church. God protects his truth. And we get all the way into proper understanding of Arrhenius and Polycarp and Papias, talking about dispensations, oikonomia and ages, aeons, and talking about premillennial views that they were taught by the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. So I have to say that Nicolaitanism, if you're accepting a post-millennial view of Christ, which most do not now, now post-millennialism has eventuated into the modern doctrine of all millennialism, where it's all allegorized away. So so Israel is allegorized and in, in, to become the church, is to the church replaces Israel, and the literal reign of Christ on earth, the, the premillennial reign of Christ on earth goes from that to postmillennialism to now. It's just all a made up allegory and it doesn't it's not going to really happen at all. And so those of you that are in the trap of replacement theology and all millennialism, I have to say that you're a daughter of the Harlot Church. You're a daughter of Roman Catholicism, and Roman Catholicism was predominantly had seeds in Nicolaitanism. Nicolaitanism is, is where that Chaldean, Babylonian seed started. And it, and it also uh, goes back farther than that into Gnosticism and back into the seed of Gnosticism, which was Docetism. 
So it goes Docetism, Gnosticism, Nicolaitanism, post-millennialism, and to all millennialism. And finally, it lands in all the different amalgamations of what has become known as replacement theology. And that's the sad fact, brothers and sisters. So I hope that you took this message in, this, Nic this message on the Nicolaitans, and I hope that you take it seriously. And I hope that you pray about it and ask yourself,